where we're speaking about the 17th century. The implication of my title is, of course, that there are tendencies that anticipate the Enlightenment already in the 16th century, I will come back to the point. The concept of history that emerged in the age of the Enlightenment goes on being familiar to us in the 21st century. There have been a number of relativizing events, the great wars of the 20th century, the civil wars that occurred in their context, and the genocides that happened. In the more recent past, it is mainly the prospect of ecological catastrophes that may have, have problematized the Enlightenment view of world history. Regardless of these factors, one might posit that the conceptualization of history as developed in the 18th century goes on being dominant in our present-day political discourses. One might even say that this view is more important and influential than it has ever been in the past. Voluntarily, I'm referring to China, or more or less involuntarily, I'm referring to India. Large parts of the, parts of the non-European world adopted this view in the course of the 20th century. As it seems, there is only one exception, namely the traditional Islamic world. But the situation in that part of our world is complex, if not contradictory. The achievements of technological modernity are highly welcome there, and as recent developments in one of the two bastions of Islamic conservatism show, I'm thinking of Saudi Arabia, it might, now, might well be the case that also the Islamic world, be it after some convergence, will agree to this master narrative on history that was created in Europe in the 18th century. The central concept of this narrative is progress. History is not characterized by the cyclical recurrence of the self-same patterns, it's rather characterized by the by permanent vectorial evolution. In contrast to natural processes, human history does not occur automatically. History is rather made by human agents. If these ones make use of the instrument that differentiates them from other living beings, namely the capacity for reason, it will be possible to enact this evolution as a process of permanent optimizing. The optimizing is understood as a liberation from material deficits of any kind, lack of food and lack of protection against the inclemencies of nature, but also as a sort of immaterial liberation that is as a process in whose core structures of dominance are substituted by freedom, and boring labor is substituted by more pleasurable and is self-chosen activity. This concept of history was first developed in the Scottish Enlightenment. I'm thinking in particular of David Hume, History of England, 1754, uh, and then in France, Voltaire, Essai sur l'histoire générale et sur les mœurs des nations, from 1756. It was instantiated by the two great revolutions that occurred in the 18th century, the American Revolution of 1776 and the French Revolution of 1789. After the French Revolution, there was a backlash, first by way of the establishment of the Napoleonian regime and then by the period called Restoration. It was Hegel, lectures on the philosophy of history from 1837, who took advantage of these complex events in order to create the variant of the Enlightenment narrative which is active, if not mandatory, up to our times. Progress is not continuous. It's rather characterized by being dialectical, as Hegel says, meaning there is backlash, there are periods of restoration. But in the final analysis, the progressive tendency is dominant, and at times history even has recourse to a device Hegel names in an anthropomorphizing fashion, cunning of reason, in German, list der Vernunft. Events that seem to be restorative may turn out to be the opposite of what they look like at first sight, they might be instantiations of exactly that progressive tendency they seem to invert. For Hegel, the regime of Emperor Napoleon is a paradigm in this respect. Napoleon put an end to the period of revolution. He restored a sort of monarchical rule, but at the same time, the wars he waged on the space of the war that Napoleon brought him into the city, Moscow, finally led to the spreading of certain basic progressive concepts all over Europe. Napoleon exported, so to speak, the notion of the equality of all citizens, regardless of their ethnic or religious belonging, 
regardless their position within the estatist system, into the still more or less feudal monarchies of Central and Eastern Europe, a process that was the origin of long-term developments, not only of European, but also of global dimensions. The radicalization of the ideas of the French Revolution that were intended by the Parisian Commune of 1871 and by the October Revolution of 1917 seemed to have failed. Finally, this might be, however, a superficial view. The idea of an equality regarding income and property that had been claimed by the theoreticians of communism and the perfection of the process of progress turned out to be counterproductive. This said, in a somewhat dialectical fashion, the idea that every human being is entitled to a material minimum, permitting her or him to live in dignity, is accepted worldwide nowadays. The, this material minimum differs from one society to another. What is important in the first place, however, is the fact that this minimum progresses, as it were. People who are on welfare in present-day Germany, that is, who live without earning an income on behalf of their own activities, attain a higher standard of living than industrial workers 35 years ago. The main reason for the ongoing dominance of the Enlightenment discourse of history is even not to be sought in the history of the continent that first created it, that is, Europe. The assumption that its progress that characterizes history seems to be irrefutable if one considers the evolution of the non-European world over the recent decades. The two numerically most important nations of our globe, India and China, successfully freed themselves from what had been the fate of their people for millennia, hunger and epidemics. Especially in China, progress is breathtaking. I have been travelling to that country on a regular basis, that is at least twice per year since 1993, not only to places like Hong Kong, Shanghai or Beijing, but also to pick just an example to cities like Shaman, located on the shores of the Pacific Ocean, vis-à-vis -vis the island of Taiwan. In the German edition of Wikipedia, the town is listed as a medium-range city of 800,000 inhabitants. Effectively, it is meanwhile a mega city of 12 million inhabitants. And on the huge lots of Shaman University campus, where students park their cars, I saw a greater number of German luxury cars than in West Los Angeles and in the inner city of Oscar. And if the gods concede me another 10 years of active life, there is no doubt that I will have the occasion to experience with my own eyes a China that has progressed further than my country of origin, Germany. The Enlightenment concept of progress is based on the assumption of universal reason available to every human being. In his famous essay, What is Enlightenment? Was ist Aufklärung from 1784, Immanuel Kant's posits that knowledge, Unmündigkeit in German, is self-imposed, self-verschuldet. As soon as human being, being decide to free, uh, human being decides to free her or himself from this Unmündigkeit, there are no limits as to progress concerning knowledge and the subsequent material and political progress. The anti-traditionalism anti propagated by Kant was, to a certain extent, in continuation of Descartes' revolutionary position that the principle of authority, that is, knowledge consecrated by tradition, is not a guarantee of truth. And it was Voltaire who created a more popular version of this anti-traditionalism by calling his famous imperative Écraser la femme. The infamous institution Voltaire wants to be destroyed is so clearly marked from an Enlightenment perspective that it's even not necessary to explicitly refer to it. It is the Christian Church that is an institution that seems to incarnate, so to speak, tradition and authority, not least by its eternal relation of mystery, that is, of the dimension of the paralogical. With different accentuations, but in the final analysis, similarly, Carl Schmidt and Leo Strauss already hinted to the fact that this myth of autonomous reason is based on a blindness which, as I might wish to add, the theoreticians of the Enlightenment had to adopt if they wanted to establish their basic thought of a universal society based on reasonable argumentation. In the following section of my paper, I'd like to demonstrate by recourse to one of the most famous Spanish Baroque dramas the extent to which the Enlightenment view of world history is against its own assumptions contingent on Christian views of worldly history. 
The Dharma I will be presenting was written by Kaldoran Velabarka. Its title is A Printite Constante, The Constant Prince. It was conceived in 1629, the first print from 1636. Long after the period of its creation, it attained an amazing popularity in 19th century Germany. After having read the text, partly in translation, partly in the original wording, Goethe wrote in a letter to Schiller that if one day all of poetry and literature gets lost, it will be able to rebuild the entire system of world literature by taking this drama as a starting point. Before I come to deal with the text, I should drop a brief remark concerning the term Baroque. On the occasion of my last visit to Moscow and while attending a conference on the Russian Baroque, I understood that the period refers to the 18th century and that it is an age of rapid progress as far as Russian history is concerned, progress originating from the very active context of several West European nations as far as England, the Netherlands and Germany. What we are used to calling Baroque with regard to Spain is to be dated to the first half of the 17th century. As to the oeuvre of Cervantes, there is controversy among the specialists. But as to the works of all the other reputed authors from that period, Calderón, Lope de Vega, Cheso de Molina, Quevedo, Gracián, there is hardly any denial that their texts are deeply influenced by the spirit of the Council Reformation, that is, the ideas developed by the Catholic Church in the course of the Council of Trent, which took place from 1545 to 1563. Uh, 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 this Council tried to develop strategies of how to roll back the massive tendencies of anti-traditionalism that had been emerging in Europe from the last decades of the 15th century onward. These tendencies concerned the sphere of dogma, I'm thinking of the Protestant Reformation, it concerned philosophy, I'm thinking of the pre-stages of autonomous rationalism, and it was later on conceptualized by Descartes, it concerned epistemology, I'm thinking of the empirical approach, as later on theorized by Bacon, it concerned cosmology, I'm thinking of the findings of Kepler and Galilei. And it concerned, finally, world view generally speaking, I'm referring to the inside becoming more and more rooted since the year 1492 that the world picture as presented in the Bible is deficient. Against these tenets and distorts the solution, the Catholic Church tried to reassert the traditional dogma as qualified by scholastic theology as well as the epistemology, the ethical system, and the general worldview linked to it. The Spanish Baroque is, to put it in the nutshell, restorative as to its profile. The arts, primarily literary texts, were meant to be a device of primary importance by which the restored discursive order was to be conveyed to the masses, to the common people. The theatre stage had a specific dimension in this respect. In age before general alphabetization, the stage was even more than the TV screen in our times, the most important, if not the only media by way of which the Counter-Reformation counter worldview could be divulged and propagated. They said, it was evident that the restoration could not be a complete restitution of the thinking of medieval times. The discovery of a new world, the cosmological revolution that at the end of geocentrism were facts. What was at stake was a rhetorical means by a way of which these elements of novelty, this progress, could be shaped as being superficial only, and in whose vein the structure as well as the content of the traditional worldview are to be perceived. Before I come to talk about the text that will be at the center of my paper, let me mention that I published more than three decades ago a book on this entire complex. Since last year, there is a revised version in English available. It exists as an open access uh, online edition as well as a print edition. I brought a copy which I will not take home again. If that is possible, I'd like to donate it to HSE's library so that students who take an interest in the extended version of my argument are able to take a look at it. The text I will be dealing with has as its central figure a personage that is historically authentic, who was indeed involved in a process of progress of world historical dimensions. The Consul Prince, whose name was Fernando, lived from 1402 to 1443. 
He was son to the Portuguese King João I, who ruled from 1385 to 1433. Much better known that this Fernando was his elder brother, who bears the name of Enrique in Calderon's text. It is Henry, who later on was named the Navigator, and who is a direct predecessor of Christopher Columbus. It was indeed Henry who first dared, dared taking steps that were considered not more than 150 years before as an outright sacrilege. In the 25th canto of the Inferno, Dante refers to a second voyage of Ulysses, of which there is no mention at all in Homer. In the context of this second voyage, Ulysses, driven by burning desire to learn more about the world, called La Dora, Chievi, Divenir, in Mondo Esperto, dares going beyond the borders of the world as established in classical pagan knowledge and at the same time in the Bible. These borders were assumed to be constituted by the Straits of Gibraltar, marked by Hercules with the famous columns, exactly in order to prevent sailors of future times to travel further westward, where nothing than death would be waiting for them. Dante's Ulysses, however, is unable to resist to the temptation. After a five month trip across the sea, so he reports to Dante and Virgil, his ship was devoured by the waves at the foot of an enormous mountain, which is meant to be my purgatory. The Portuguese prince Henry did no longer take these warnings seriously. Further and further, he sailed from Lisbon southward, he discovered the Azores, the island of Madeira, and the islands of Cape Verde, that is the coast of West Africa down to present-day Senegal and Nigeria. Had Christopher Columbus not had at his disposal the nautical findings and experiences made by Henry, his chances to fortunately arrive in America would not have even been less than they were anyway. The Calderonian drama, however, does not focus on these far-reaching expeditions for which Henry is famous into the present. The playwright rather thematizes the very first tentative steps of the Europeans of the early modern period to explore beyond the borders of what had been considered until that period as the entire world. From chronicles used by Cardon, which he massively re-accentuated with, with a view to propagating his counter-reformation worldview, we may gather that these first steps did not at all obey to a grand design, but were rather events that occurred by contingency. In the year 1415, the Portuguese had conquered <coughs> Ceuta, the Moroccan city directly opposite of Gibraltar. But they did not have any plans of exploring further into Moroccan territory at that time. They just wanted to secure the control over the states of Gibraltar. That is, they wanted to make sure that they had free access to the Mediterranean at any time. This conquest by the Portuguese, however, triggered the ambition of, of the then King of Castile. Up until the unification of the various Spanish-speaking kingdoms and principalities by Fernando and Isabel, there was indeed a competition regarding power and influence on the Iberian Peninsula in which the Portuguese king held an important role. Accordingly, the king of Castile developed plans to also spread his power to the African continent. As the Portuguese king's younger brothers, Henry and Fernando, were planning to support the King of Castile regarding these very friends' activities, Don Duarte, the Portuguese king, devised a plan to rather make use of his brothers or rather their battle force for his own purposes by asking them to conquer the city of Tangier on the Atlantic coast. The motivation he publicly uttered when presenting his plans to his legion was to impose Catholic faith on the inhabitants of Tangier, quote, para someter a Vija or Jugo da Santa Fe Católica. Obviously, this motivation was given by the king in order to veil a base calculus regarding power. Accordingly, the expedition was not very well prepared and the equipment was insufficient. In July 1437, the Portuguese ships landed at Azila, a small city on the coast, 30 kilometers south of Tangier. In the course of one day of battle, the Prince of Morocco succeeded, succeeded in devastatingly defeating him. The Portuguese surrendered to him and were conceded unimpeded withdrawal. The condition imposed by the victors was, however, the restitution of the city of Ceuta. 
La Siraca, the Moroccan general, asked for hostages to be delivered who were to vouch for the compliance on the Portuguese part of the stipulations of the Treaty of Capitulation. It is in accordance with the rules obtaining in that age that it was not Henry, the admiral of the Portuguese fleet, but rather Fernando, his younger brother, who had to go into Moroccan captivity. As what may be gathered from the chronicles, but also from Cabron's drama, the liberation of the Portuguese prince from captivity did finally not materialize. In the beginning, Fernando is kept by the Moroccans according to his princely status. When it turned out that the Portuguese court showed little willingness to honor the Treaty of Capitulation, the Moroccans made the conditions of the imprisonment more and more severe. After many years of captivity, under humiliating circumstances, Prince Fernando finally died in prison in the year 1443 from an infectious disease, a sort of diarrhea. The reasons given for this fatal outcome differ dramatically between the information contained in the chronicle texts and the drama by Karl Rahm. The author of the chronicle, Alvarez by name, says that the Portuguese king had summoned the estates in order to get an endorsement for his decision to not give the city of Ceuta back to the Moroccans. As a substitute, the Portuguese offer a ransom. Their final offer, after lengthy negotiations, amounts to just 15% of what the Moroccans asked for, or to put it explicitly, the Portuguese king was ready to rather accept that his brother died in captivity than to give back the territories conquered on the northern fringe of Africa or to divest himself of an important part of his material property. In Calderon, by contrast, Fernando's death in captivity is presented as an act of martyrdom. In the drama, it is Fernando himself who asks his brother, the king, to not surrender Ceuta at any terms, <coughs> because that would mean that the inhabitants who had adopted Christianity after the conquest, willingly or not, will become renegades, apostates, according to Christian dogma, they will have gone to hell after death. Anticipating such a scenario, the Calderonian Fernando is now ready to die in the interest of the Christian faith. As to the historically authentic events, it should take 28 years until the Portuguese risked another attempt at appropriating parts of northern Africa. In the year 1471, a new younger king, Alfonso, who will be na named later on El Africano, starts a second expedition southward. Before the Portuguese court had arranged the beatification of Fernando, we proclaimed by the papal curia. The chronicler Alvarez, who was one of those who were freed from Moroccan captivity, says in the passage of his text with this, may be intentionally somewhat obscure that Fernando himself had left a secret written message to his relatives living in Portugal in which he had asked them to continue what he had begun and to not rest until they would have conquered the Moors' territories and established Christian faith. Not as to ideology, but as to the temporal arrangement, Calderon presents a totally different version. The 28 years between the first and the second Portuguese expedition are deleted by way of what is called in classical rhetoric a pretaizio. In, in the drama, Alfonso lands on the shores of the African Atlantic coast immediately after Fernando died. Riding a horse, Fernando appears to Alfonso and the entire Portuguese army. In the first moment, Alfonso is not even conscious of the fact that this Fernando is not his living uncle, but rather the spirit or the ghost of his dead uncle. As a miraculous apparition, Fernando takes the lead of the four Portuguese troops and guides them towards a brilliant victory. Indeed, Tangier and the surrounding territories are conquered by the Portuguese, but as said, not in 1443, as conveyed in Calderon, but only in 1471. Starting from the stronghold, they discovered Madeira and the islands of Cap Verde, and not more than 20 years later, Christopher Columbus, who lived for a couple of years on a small island adjacent to Madeira, devised his grand design to travel westward, a venture that did not bring him to India as he intended to, but rather into the New World, which was under the control of the Portuguese and the Spaniards when Calderon wrote his plan. For an adequate understanding of the drama, 
It is necessary to see what nowadays can be detected only by way of scholarly erudition, but was obvious to any contemporary spectators who assisted to a performance of the play. Fernando's ghost, appearing at the gates of Tangier and leading the Christian army to victory, is the reinstantiating of an apparition that is ascribed to Santiago, the national saint of Spain. Jacob, Saint Jacob in Spanish, Santiago, was one of Christ's disciples and, as most of them, suffered martyrdom in the year 44. According to the Christian tradition, his corpse was transported to the Iberian Peninsula by angels and was buried there. Let me remind you that the peninsula, whose inhabitants had converted to Christianity under the rule of the Roman Emperor Constantine, who embraced the new religion in the year 313, had been conquered step by step by Muslim armies from the year 711 onward. Only in the remote valleys of the Pyrenees, some small Christian principalities had survived. No less convinced than the Muslims that their faith was the only true faith, the inhabitants of these small principalities started at the end of the 8th century what is called a Reconquista in Spanish, the attempt at reconquering the entire peninsula. The fight lasted over centuries. It ended only in 1492, Granada, the last Moorish bastion on European territory, found just a couple of months before Christopher Columbus started out. The decisive event, in the sense of a turning point from defensive to offensive war, is dated by the Spanish and the Christian tradition to the battle at Clavijo. It took place in 844. In the course of this battle, the ghost of Santiago is said to have appeared to the Christian troops on a battle horse. Riding in the first line, Jacob is said to even have killed thousands of Moors by his own hands, thence his name, Santiago Matamoros, Saint Jacob, the killer of Moors. I come to some concluding remarks. What does the remodeling of the events pertaining to the first Portuguese expedition to Africa, which you can gather them from a reading of Cabron's Down Me in terms of philosophy of history? They imply in the first place the assumption that the historical process does not consist of a concatenation of random events. History proceeds according to a limited number of concise patterns that become reenacted again and again, while the changes between the reenactments are superficial only. These patterns are established by God, and He has even revealed them to humans, meaning they are recognizable, at least to those who are willing to see them. The historical Jacob from the first century of the Common Era fulfills the missionary commandment issued by the founder of the religion, Christ, go and make disciples of all nations, etc. Some 800 years later, the ghost of Jacob renews this missionary work when he provides, in the context of the battle at Clavijo, the decisive impulse for the re-Christianization of the Iberian Peninsula. Another 600 years later, this pattern is reinstantiated with the ghost of Fernando, the central agent, and it stretches its validity to territories still unknown from the perspective of biblical cosmology in the first step to Atlantic Northern Africa. I should add that the playwright Padron also produced several dramas dealing with the European expansion into territory that had remained totally unknown until that point in time, that is, into America. The best known among these texts bear the title La Aurora in Copacabana. It deals with the conquest of the Inca Empire, that is Peru, by Pizarro, which took place in the year 1532. Uh, Without going into the details of this letter text, it may suffice to say that the events around the conquest of the Inca capital Cusco take on in exactly the same shape as the events in the context of the battles in Clavijo or Tangier. There is a first battle ending in a catastrophe. Next, there is a second battle, in the course of which there occurs a miracle that is a divinely ordained change of the course of events to be expected according to the laws of empirical reality. Finally, there is a triumph triumphant victory when it's taken for granted that the fight was conducted in the interest of spreading the two, meaning the Christian faith. Without any doubt, the narrative that is at the basis of this pattern is the arch narrative that has emerged in the context of the establishment of early Christianity, naming the sequence of death, 
miraculous resurrection of final China. And the idea to conceive of historically specific events as reinstantiations of events in the past is based on a hermeneutical practice established by the new religion in order to legitimize the integrated postulate of being a continuation and at the same time a perfection of his own pre-stage, namely Judaism. Theologians and historians of ideas name this practice typological or figural interpretation. To give just one famous example from the works of the Church of Augustine, Abraham's conceiving his son first with the slave woman Hagar and next with Sarah, his legitimate wife, prefigures God's covenant first with the synagogue and then with the ecclesia with Christianity. It was already in the late antiquity, according to my findings in the Gita of Emperor Constantine written by Eusebius of Caesarea, that this scheme was applied to secular history also. The defeat of the troops of Maxentius, Constantine's rival, who was of pagan faith, and their drowning in the waters of the, waters of the river Tiber in the course of the Battle of the Million Bridge, 312, is interpreted by Eusebius as a reinstantiation of the drowning of Pharaoh of two in the waters of the Red Sea. Constantine, the first Christian emperor, thus turns out to be a new Moses, leading the peoples of the entire Roman Empire into the promised land of the true faith. It is already at this stage that it is in Eusebius that the characteristic of such a modeling of history becomes obvious. It consists in presenting history as a repetition of patterns conveyed by revelation, while the differentiating factor of the reinstantiation mainly consists as to quantity. Is the supposedly secular conceptualization of history, as developed in the European Enlightenment, something substantively different from such a typologizing conceptualization as first developed in the late antiquity and propagated anew in the times of Spanish Baroque, structurally seen, of course, since the obviously religious contents have been deleted? Is it the case that all narratives of progress conceive of history as concentric, mainly quantitative propagation, implying temporal backlashes of one basic pattern, namely the assumption that all human beings, regardless of their specific origins and traditions, will sooner or later adopt the Western model of civilization with all its components? It needs to be added that these components also are based on the Christian dogma, universalism, which did not exist at all previously, the dignity of human beings, which derived from the assumption that humans have been created by God in his likeness, the assumption that every human is in dark of reason, a feature Christian theology developed in the course of its Hellenization as a concretizing of what that means, God likeness, finally the assumption that there will be an end to all miseries and constraints, the only difference being that in the secular version of this narrative, the liberation is assumed to occur on earth and not in the world beyond. It seems that this latter element is indeed the only differentiating factor. The clarity of the light brought by the Enlightenment seems to have produced, as every light does, zones of obscurity also, in the first place such that concern the Enlightenment self-reflection. Thank you for your attention.
And uh, where can we find that the Enlightenment narrative is a symmetry? If we have a repetition, yes, of some event mm. uh, which recurs mm. on a new stage of mm. history. Mm. They are ontological, ontologically not equal, yes. Mm. Uh, could you just cite an example of this? Yeah. Mm. <coughs> you see, the, the asymmetry to which we refer between uh, type and uh, um, of the type mm -hmm. is to be understood if you consider the examples as developed uh, mm -hmm. already by, by Paul in his uh, letter to the Ephesians and also by Augustine. It's always meant to be a sort of progress as to quality. Mm -hmm. For instance, in Paul, you have already had the idea that Christ is the anti-type to Adam. Adam calls humanity to, to fall, that is uh, brought about universal death. And Christ redeemed humanity that is uh, restituted eternal uh, life. And also, in the example from Augustine that I gave, mm -hmm. Augustine concerns the two sons conceived by Abraham, the first with the slave woman uh, uh, as a prototype, uh, as, as signifying uh, uh, God's, uh, yeah, how should I say, God's covenant uh, with the Jews, and the second one. Uh, his legitimate son as God's covenant with the Christian. It is also, this is meant to be a promise. And there is a structural element that is inherent in the Enlightenment uh, narrative as well. Uh, every next step in history is a step further towards the brilliant future. Whereas that was part of my argument, also the Enlightenment narrative, at least in the version as it was uh, remodeled in the 19th century by Hegel, incorporates this idea of temporal backlash that we have in the Christian narrative as well. So before we could, could uh, repair what Adam had done, Christ had to die. That was the previous death, you see, uh, the backlash. It's not a continuous evolution. And this idea we have it in Hegel as well, in his great idea that there is progress, that progress is not continuous. But let me stress once again, perhaps I didn't make that sufficiently clear, uh, that the United takes from this Christian discourse of history only the structure, not the contents. The great difference is, of course, that progress according to the Enlightenment uh, narrative is to be realized in our material world, not in the world beyond, whereas the Christian narrative promises. Uh, to come back to this example, uh, uh, eternal life, uh, not for our world, but only for a world beyond we are not able to experience with our senses uh, while we are living in our belief. But the structure seems to be a very similar. Yeah. So that which uh, structurally, that which remains in the Latin narrative is the uh, progress, but not the repetition, yes? Also the repetition, you see, uh, since uh, what, what does progress mean from a Latin perspective? Uh, it means that uh, all the world, uh, regardless of specific tradition, should imitate the Western model. <laughs> that is true, yeah. That is uh, uh, frequently criticized imperialism of Western thought, and we go to European people, including Eastern Europe, since you are also Europeans. Uh, take for granted that the rest of the world should adopt our way of thinking, uh, our ethical norms, our political system, our way of industrial production, uh, our love for material goods, and so on and so forth. And that goes uncontested. That is our faith. Uh, and what is astonishing, of course, that I tried, that is what I tried to stress in the introductory, the introductory passages of my paper, that astonishes me in the first place when I'm traveling around the world, it seemed that this is even true. See, the Chinese, which come from a completely different traditional background, have adopted this Western idea of continuous progress in a way that is totally amazing. I don't know where that will be, but uh, that is a fact. Yes. We could discuss time for a long time, but maybe not here today, <laughs> um, else 
maybe a little bit provocative question. <laughs> um, seen very much from the outside, not as a fan. The question arises to which extent this expropriation of the past um, and the idea that the second event is a completion of an imperfect archetype is propaganda, if you think about Constantine. Mm -hmm. This is, to me, this does not appear to be just an authentic statement about what people think about the world and their place in the world. Mm -hmm. But, of course, needs to have some kind of legitimizing function. Mm -hmm. Then the question arises to which extent this is applicable to the Enlightenment too. Mm -hmm. So to which extent would you believe that this kind of moral imperialism to describe enlightenment as a perfection of an imperfect state of mankind has this propagandistic function too, or to which extent would you believe that people like you, Voltaire, and Kant could be believed not to have this hidden agenda? Yeah. <laughs> that is something that I tried to stress the, the last sentence that I gave. Uh, that of course every enlightenment and every light by necessity produces zones of obscurity. <laughs> <laughs> zones of obscurity very frequently. I'll write that down. That's a very good answer. <laughs> 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 these zones of obscurity fill <coughs> almost uh, in almost all cases your own position. You see, that is the fact. Uh, Kant uh, posits that there is universal reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but how does he come to this idea? That is basically, of course, a secularized Christian idea. Uh, according to the Christian narrative, uh, we all have a body that is generated by our parents, so it's material, uh, it's problematic. But in addition, we have this soul that has been created for every human being by God himself in his likeness, you see, mm -hmm. and that was the great dogma that was created around the second century, that this God-likeness is to be interpreted as being endowed with reason. Uh, is every human being really endowed with reason? That is an assumption. I would not, I would not say that the assumption is wrong, no, no, that is my belief as well. But uh, I hope that I make it clear that I'm conscious of the fact that it is a belief. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult because at the same time we are all radically evil. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. We yeah, constitutively yeah. choose maxims that do not propagate more. That is also the Christian assumption. You see, that is of course the myth of the original sin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this constant conflict between body and soul, mm -hmm. body and reason, and so on and so forth. Uh, that is, of course, the, what I tried to convey here. The self-image of the Enlightenment is that it was an edifice of thought that was erected uh, by way of rejecting the traditional dogma. That mm -hmm. seems to me a very problematic assumption. Uh, there is uh, much more of Christian thinking in modern Christian thought uh, than is com commonly believed, especially uh, by the Enlightenment mm -hmm. philosophers themselves. That was the intention of the there is, there is there's someone sitting behind you. Sitting behind you. There's a question. Thank you. I wanted to ask how do you see your relationship to people like Thomas Ludenberg yeah. and their critique of Lewis? Although I have to say, I studied with him only for two semesters when I was um, 18 years old, and at that time I didn't seize uh, the dimension of his reflection. But later on, when he was already dead, I uh, turned back to intensive reading of Blumenberg and the book I referred to in, in the beginning, uh, you will find in footnotes uh, that most of the references to philosophers are to Hans Blumenberg and his great uh, publication on the legitimacy mm -hmm. of 
the modern world. I, I don't know whether there is a translation to Russian as yet. No? The English translation is Unfortunately. Very yeah. It should be one. It's yeah. such but a good book. Do you have a specific reason for well, raising this? Just to narrow it down. Yeah. Your interest in literature mm -hmm. and his thesis that it's a continual self transcendence in his big categories and metaphor. Yeah. But how that really is totally different from curiosity that people like Augustine in the Christian tradition sort of see curiosity as marking off a whole new way of thinking about the person anthropologically than the mm -hmm. secularization of life. Yeah. So I just sort of wondered in your references to all of the, mm -hmm. the literature, it's, it felt sort of blue and very but at the same time. You were, you were more skeptical about the big difference that he seems to kind of see. Yeah, um, let me come back to the point you are making, the question of curiosity, since I referred to this right. point uh, when I quoted uh, Dante. There is, of course, a difference. You see, in Augustine, curiositas is a sin. Whenever we give in to this impulse, uh, we go the wrong way. Uh, and for that reason, Dante places uh, for other reasons as well, but it's one of the reasons why he has this to go to her. He was curious. Uh, that is not legitimate from a Christian standpoint. And as I clearly said, these people from the early modern age, first the Portuguese and then the Spanish, they rejected this idea. They insisted uh, on that their cura curiosity is legitimate. And that, of course, is the cause of a big difference between enlightenment thinking and the Christian narrative. And this difference consists in the fact that the enlightenment thinking transposes to the secular world of the Christian narrative, fostering its only world world beyond. And that is, of course, <coughs> uh, the enlightenment is not a variant of Christianity. It's what Lundberg calls uh, in German an Umbesetzung. That mm -hmm. is, yeah, what, what might the right expression be in English? I have to check that once again. So it's, it's, it's when you take a structure from one field of discourse and transpose it, Umbesetzung means to transpose it mm -hmm. to another field, and also the contents become changed, but the structure remains identical, and that is, from my perspective, quite decisive point. Mm -hmm.